Good morning. Good morning. Let me see. Let's uh, pray first. Ask God to help us. Um, Father, we thank you for bringing us here together as a body. Lord, I pray that um, you'll help us um, as we're here to hear your word. Um, help us when we help us to see ourselves um, through the mirror that you provide in your work and those areas where we need to repent and turn. I pray that you'll uh, give us the power to do that. Um, Lord, I pray also that for those who um, don't have children right now or have had children, they've left the house, Lord, that you'll also speak to them through the passages that we're going to look at and help them to be nourished and encouraged as well. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Okay, well, I am, I am standing before you like Anne did when she talked about uh, submission a few weeks ago. I'm standing before you with fear and trembling because I realized that my oldest child is eight. So anything that I say now can be used against me when they're like 13 or 14 or 15. So I understand, um, and I want you to hear me now, I'm not, as I preach this sermon, I'm not saying uh, do as we do, or I'm a model for you and for parenting because if, I mean, I'm just not, I'm, I'm a bad father, I'm just not, I'm not the perfect father, I'm just not. So um, don't look at me or Anne as models. Um, we will be trying to ground, I'm going to be trying to ground what I say in Scripture, and to the extent I do that, this will be a good sermon, to the extent that I don't, it will be a horrible sermon. Um, so uh, why don't we try to um, uh, look together at what the Bible tells us about um, children and parents. Uh, we're going to be our Bible marked in four places um, today. The first one is going to be in Ephesians chapter 6. And, and the second is in Colossians 3. You're going to need to keep those, like maybe between your fingers or something, so you can flip back and forth very rapidly between those two. Those are going to be the ones we're looking at most often. Ephesians 6 and Colossians 3. Then um, we'll be looking at Hebrews chapter 12. That means we're going to be taking a right from Ephesians and Colossians to find Hebrews 12. And the last passage is going to be Deuteronomy, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, um, Deuteronomy chapter 11. So uh, Ephesians 6, Colossians 3, Hebrews 12, Deuteronomy 11. All right. Last week, I'm going to give you a quiz. I hope you're listening. What are the two truths that we discuss that, that apply to all human beings? What's the first truth we talked about? Anyone? We're all sinners. We're all fallen, right? So the moment we come out of our mama, we are already selfish little, little things, right? I mean, we're we're self-centered. We are um, we desire our own way, and so that's just defines who we are. What's the second truth? The creating image of God. And so even though we're fallen, we have this deep desire for joy and for satisfaction and for fulfillment. So um, we're looking for that somewhere, anywhere, right? And so um, because we know as Christians that uh, we are created to enjoy God, to glorify God and enjoy Him forever, we know that nobody's going to be satisfied with anything this world has to offer unless and until they surrender and submit and come to Jesus Christ. So those two, two, two truths working together form the foundation for everything the Bible says about how to raise children, right? They need, when they're young, to obey their parents because they're fallen and they're probably not very wise. They're foolish, right? I was foolish. If you're still living with your parents, and some, to some extent, you're foolish. I love you, but you're foolish in that. And to some extent. And um, then secondly, though, as parents, our task is to direct, to direct them toward Jesus where true joy is to be found. Um, that's what our task is. So, um, we looked at the, uh, the command to children last week. This week, you're going to turn to the command to uh, parents. And it's going to seem at first like we're going backwards. Let's have, if, I, if you have Ephesians and Colossians at hand, hold those two passages, Ephesians 6 and Colossians 3, the three little fingers, and let's um, look. Um, first, at this command that begins in verse 1 of chapter 6 of Ephesians, where parents or children are told, Obey your parents, for this is right. And you see Paul quotes the fifth commandment in verse 2, and he says, Honor your father and your mother. See that? 
Now, Colossians 3, verse 20, Paul says, Children, obey your parents in everything. I love that part. I love that part. In everything, um, for this pleases the Lord. Okay, now, question for parents. How are children supposed to learn to follow these commands? Right? Okay, they're following, right? So they're not just coming out ready to do this stuff, right? So that means God set them in your home, in your household, for a purpose. And um, that purpose actually is given to us. If you have Ephesians 6, verse 4 um, open, you can see it. And that purpose is to bring kids up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Now, let's do some, like, just logic here. If you as a parent are supposed to bring your kids up in the discipline and instruction of the, of the Lord, and the instruction of the Lord is obey the children, is obey your parents, that means that you as parents need to do what? Make the little suckers obey, right? <laughs> You're to train them and teach them obedience and respect for you. That's hard. Just relationally speaking, that can be very, very difficult. Um, this summer, our kids have constructed forts, like lots of little forts out of blankets and tables and stuff, in the playroom. Uh, they asked to do that during the school year. And during the school year, we ended up early in the morning, so we said no, we didn't let them do that. But during the summer, they've been able to do that. They've been sitting at making forts in the playroom, they've been sleeping there and staying up late at night and waking up. Thankfully for us, late in the morning. And that's very, very it's great. Now, when we said yes, the first time that we've been saying no for the entire year, um, we were like, it was like praise and adoration. They loved us. They, they, they really loved us. If I were to quote that actress, they loved me. But it was, it was amazing how, um, how affectionate um, they became um, when we said yes. They were dancing little circles around us and praising. Um, and I like that. That felt really good. I really like saying yes to my kids, and I like it when, in response to that yes, they give me affection. That feels good. It has created a warmth that can be addictive. See, because I noticed this in myself that this summer has been like we've had this it's like been this wonderful period of the taunt in the house. Everyone's very happy and, and nice with each other. I I in response to that, because I want my children to like me so much, I've been tempted to turn a blind eye to certain acts of defiance and rebellion. Because I want the, I want the good time to keep rolling. We're having a good time. Now, that's a trap. I want my children to like me, and I'm coming close, or I have come close very recently to fooling myself into believing that, you know, just giving them stuff they want, and then ignoring things like disobedience and disrespect, will win affection and a happy home. And in the short term, it does. But, I think we can see in these commands that being a parent means making long-term joy take precedence over short-term happiness. And our goal as parents is to be long-term, maybe say eternal, joy for our children, not short-term happiness. So, um, think about the way that God loves us. And you don't just have to think about it, you can see it. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. And this whole section, beginning, I think, in verse 4 or 5, is, is just wonderful. We're going to start in, chapter, in verse 6 of chapter 12. The Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. And skip a little bit. God in discipline is treating you as sons. 
If you're left without discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. So if you're being disciplined by God, if God is putting you through the ringer, what this is saying is he loves you. Now, this is why I get really frustrated. Who watches TV and Trinity Broadcasting Network? You know what this is. You see it on TV. If you get cable, you can see it. And, um, it's the lady with the big hair and the um, golden uh, furniture and the set. And every once in a while, you have a preacher on there. And the preacher's always saying something like, hey, give your life to Jesus. And you're going to be healed of all your diseases. And you're going to get the Mercedes in your garage. And God's going to bless you with all kinds of money. Those kinds of guys. I get really frustrated with that. Because my experience, and I think probably the common experience of people when they come to faith in Jesus Christ, is not all of a sudden happy, happy, joy, joy. Right? I mean, there's, there's a happy, happy, joy, joy in my heart. That's true. But like, then stuff starts getting stripped away from you. So actually, sometimes life gets worse when you become a Christian because you've got to give up things that you've leaned on, you've depended on up until that time. And if you don't give them up, sometimes God just takes them away. Right? You know why that is? Do you know why that is? Because God has your eternal joy in mind above and beyond your right now happiness. He's very ready, very ready to make you miserable now so you will be eternally joyful. He'll do it. He does it. And that's our model as parents. Eternal joy, not momentary happiness. Now, so what this, let's just turn this back then to the command to children to honor and obey um, their parents. If you, as a parent, don't insist, insist on being honored, and respect it, both you and your spouse, and obey it. Even when they hate you, I hate you, mommy, I hate you, even when they hate you because of it, their natural tendency to defiance will take root and grow hard. If they don't obey and respect you, do not be deceived. They will not respect their teachers. They will not obey their teachers or their bosses or anybody else in authority over them. And if they discount what you say and you allow them to defy you, do not think they'll give a fig for your God or your Bible or your church. They won't care. They've already learned to discount what you said. So why should they listen to you when you talk about Jesus? You teach obedience and respect from you know, a little two-year-old kid on so that when the time comes to open your Bible and tell them about Jesus, they'll listen and their souls are already, already hardened into defiance and anger and frustration. They're willing to listen to you. It's a good thing. All right, so how do you do that, though? I mean, if we as parents are responsible for teaching obedience and respect to our children, what, how do we do that? Well, um, notice this, and this is both in Colossians and in um, Ephesians 6, Colossians and Ephesians 6. Like, this is interesting because God speaks directly to children in those places you'd expect God to say, well, parents can do this. But here, God's speaking directly to children. He's saying, obey your parents, right? Um, notice that when he does that, he doesn't like throw down the Leviticus from on high, right? There's not like 613 childhood laws that God gives for kids. All right, kids, memorize law number 536. No, there's two. Two laws. Very simple. Obey your parents, right? And honor them. Awesome. Now, when Anna and I first had a, oh, we're pregnant with Anna, we had a first baby, we were looking all over for, you know, ideas for discipline and how to raise our children right, and, you know, we, we looked at all, a lot of parents and books and stuff, and we did happen on one book, I'll tell you the name of it later, but we did happen on one book that has given us the best, I think, 
um, suggestion because it pointed us right back here to Colossians chapter 3 and Ephesians chapter 6. So there's, a really neat, there's really only needs to be two rules in a Christian household for kids. One is immediate obedience. Right? So you say, hey, Johnny, go pick up your room. And then Johnny better be getting up to go pick up his room. Okay? See, none of this like one, two, three. I think Johnny can get to three before you go pick up your room because if Johnny can obey at three, then he can obey at one, right? All you're doing if you give him the one, two, three thing is you're, 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 you're teaching him to disobey him for a little bit and finally when he decides to get up and do what he wants to do, what you want him to do. But if you, immediate obedience means immediate obedience. This is what is um, a necessary thing to teach. We've tried this in our house, and, and to be honest, we've really messed up sometimes, but when we do it consistently, when we insist that the moment I say something or mommy says something, you do it, and if you don't do it, there's consequences, it's been very peaceful in our home because of this. Very clear on When mommy and daddy say something, you do it. Great. So we're going to have to have a list of laws in the refrigerator? Dark thing. No, just clean your room. Okay. There you go. Second rule is no disrespect or defiance in attitude and word. Because you can get to the point where your kid says, okay, yeah, I'm going to do that. And when you say it, but then they do it like this. Or, or this. All right, they all look me now because their hair is like over their eyes and just walking around like this. And you don't know what kind of face they're making, right? You say it. Right? Um, so, um, so the rule there is, you know, no, you are, your attitude is to be one of respect. So, no uh, curled lips, no sighs, no rolling of the eyes. Look your mama in the eye when she's talking to you. And if I, as father, get even a whiff of disrespect, you're going to have to deal with me. You're not going to like it. So our kids know, like, we're going to hear about this again. So our kids know they don't say no. To mama or daddy, or was a problem. So now they do things like, I'm tired. They, they figure out really well, but they know they don't do the no thing. Now, this does work. Again, you know, we're not perfect at it, but just following these commands, just imposing the commands that we see here in Colossians 3 and Ephesians 6, it actually works. I've seen it, it it's amazing. Um, you don't even have to be a good parent, just this, just two things you gotta remember there, right? And it does work only when there are immediate and serious consequences for disobedience that change as you get older, right? So um, some of you, and I, I don't see any problem visually with spanking, we do it, but um, spanking, not hitting, right? a big, huge difference. That's, there's a reason there's a cushion back there. And nowhere else in your body should be touched or hit by a, um, by a father. So um, that's fine. But whatever you're talking about, discipline, this one has to be immediate, and serious, and it probably should change as they get older. You don't need to spank a 13 year old, it's ridiculous. So, right? so, so there's, there's, there's immediate consequences for disobedience. Immediate. It happens right now, right? Okay, so um, now again, our kids, as you know, are not perfect, but when we follow this biblical model consistently, it does make for a peaceful home and happy kids because the boundaries are absolutely clear. They are free to eat from any tree in the garden except those two trees. And so they have like a little nice, peaceful um, garden of Eden setting. They can run around and have fun. And in fact, they're quite happy this way. Because they wouldn't be if they had a list of 95,000 rules in the fall. Okay, so for the first, the first responsibility for parents is insisting on both obedience and respect. Now, notice... And we're not going to talk a lot about this. I just want to, I do want to touch on it for a, briefly. But notice in both Colossians 3 and Ephesians 6 um, that when God directly addresses parents, He speaks to the Father. Notice that? You see it? God wants fathers. We've said, we said this a couple of sermons ago, so again, I'm not going to dwell on it. But God, um, God wants fathers ultimately responsible for the discipline and instruction of their children. That means dads. You can't just voice that off on mom. Right? You can't just sit there and keep watching TV or playing on the computer or whatever while the kids are giving mama that. You can't blame mama when things go bad. This is It's your responsibility. You get 
step up and take it, right? And moms, I, I gotta say, you know, sometimes there's a tendency, not in all moms, but there's sometimes there's a tendency in some moms when daddy wants to discipline to say, oh, not my kids, right? And and that taken to an extreme can be very, very hard on your kids because what they're gonna learn is ultimately that mommy's on one side and daddy's on the other side, and so they can find a way to manipulate you and get what they want because they know you're going to cover for them and you're not going to hurt them. You're not going to punish them, right? So they're going to come to you and you're going to disobey daddy. But if you're both united, right? If you're both united and consistent, then there's a chance they're going to learn obedience and respect rather than how to manipulate. God gives the father the primary role in discipline. So in the end, even if you don't agree, unless he's abusive, right? I mean, if he's beating, if he's, if he's abusive father, emotionally or physically, that all goes out the window. But unless he's abusive, back him up. It's important. Okay, um, now we get to the part that kids love best. So let's look, let's keep looking at Ephesians 6 and Colossians 3. Ephesians 6, 4 begins this way. Fathers, do not provoke children to anger. I can't wait till my kids really get into the Bible and throw this passage at me they're going to. Um, Colossians 3, verse 21 says, Fathers, don't provoke or discourage your children. So here's a question. Maybe we can figure this out. How are you supposed to teach kids to obey and honor you without provoking anger? You have to say no to the things they want to do, and you can't say yes, or you have to say do the things they don't want to do, right? So it's almost set up to provoke anger. How can, how can this work? All right, well, the reason we're having a problem with this is because we speak English and not Greek. This is what the problem is. The commands in both Ephesians 6 and Colossians 4 are in the present tense. Now, in English, when you use the present tense, you can be thinking about an action that begins and has an ending. Uh, like, I'm preaching a sermon now, it's present tense, but I'll be finished in a few minutes. So, have one more. Um, so, that's, that's kind of what we use present tense in English. In, in Greek, if you use the present tense, it's an ongoing, continuous action. It's here in the present, but doesn't have any end. Right? So, what this means is, um, God is not saying, don't make your kids angry. Sorry, kids, I'm sorry. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, don't raise them in such a way that anger and discouragement become an ongoing characteristic of your life. Alright, so, so, if your kid's mad at you, it doesn't mean that you've broken this, this instruction, necessarily. Making your kids angry in the short term often is necessary. Why do I say that? Well, um, you don't have to turn here, but you can write it down and look it up when you get home. Romans 10, um, verse 19 is the only other place where the word for provoking to anger that you find in Ephesians 6, 4, which is actually one word in Greek, is found. And there, God provokes to anger Jews, ethnic Israel, in order to get them jealous, he does it by, by blessing Gentiles, in order to get them jealous and ultimately they'll come to faith in Jesus Christ and be saved. So he purposely there provokes anger and jealousy so that they will come to faith in Jesus. So sometimes God can do short, that short term for the long term benefit, so can we. The same time we're talking about. God's concerned with eternal joy as opposed to temporary passing happiness. Alright, so let's just pretend that you did want to discourage your children. This is saying don't do it. How, how would you, if you wanted to discourage, if you wanted to provoke long-term anger in your children, how would you do it? Well, uh, here are just five ways I put together, just briefly. Um, some of them are directly uh, tied to Scripture. Some of them are just plain experience. Um, but let's just, uh, let me go through them real fast. The first one is just know Jesus, right? And by know Jesus, I don't mean in K N O W Jesus, I mean in O Jesus, right? Because again, we like we said a minute, a minute ago, they are looking for satisfaction and fulfillment 
and joy and nothing else will give them that. So if you refuse to point them to Jesus, that hunger inside of them is going to still be there and they're going to look for satisfaction in all sorts of things that you probably don't want them looking for satisfaction in. Right? And so ultimately what's going to happen is they're going to end up in life being frustrated and disappointed and ultimately angry because nothing fills them. Nothing brings them joy like it should. So if you want to discourage and make your children angry over the long term, don't bring them to church, don't bring them to youth group, don't tell them about Jesus, never crack open your Bible. Um, just if you come to church, just come on Sundays and afterwards forget everything that was said and go home and don't worry about it. Then you can make your children long term angry and frustrated. Second thing, if you discipline in a way that is linked to anger, this is huge. When I lose my temper and discipline my kids, I don't teach them that when you break a rule, there are consequences. What do I teach them? I better not make daddy mad. I better not make daddy mad. They don't link their own bad behavior to the consequences that follow, which is what the Bible wants us to do in teaching obedience. They link consequences to your temper. Okay, listen, there is no reason, I'm talking to myself as well, there is no reason ever, unless your kid's running out to a in this busy street there, you run over by a bus, there is no reason ever to raise your voice at your children. Or anyone else's children, especially. Right? No reason. Well, how can you disagree about that? Well, very easy, right? So, um, like today, Rowan was in class Sunday school. I don't know if you've heard of him. He was screaming and crying. And the reason he was screaming and crying is because um, he was being disobedient in the Sunday school room to his mama, um, which he knows is not necessary and isn't allowed. Um, so, I took him up in the back and we had a little moment together. Um, I was mad. So, okay, what, what happened? What, what happened, Rowan? Did you, were you disobedient to mommy? Yes, okay, well, let's, 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 let's take care of that. Here are the consequences. Oh, okay, you said no to mommy? Okay, well, let's, let's go take care of that. I love you very much. That's why I'm doing this. But if you're like, And that's going to produce over time anger and discouragement. Otherwise, if you do it the right way, they learn, oh, I broke the rule and I received the just one. Third thing that can really discourage and anger your kid lack of affection. I mean, how many here love God? Good. Now, I know we don't love God perfectly, right? We don't, we're not perfectly good at that. But we do love God. Now, does anyone know why the Bible says that we love God? Because He first loved us, right? Exactly. Exactly. Um, scripture tells us we wouldn't love God if He hadn't loved us first. God showers us with affection and kindness. He writes your name on the palm of His hand. He's not just your great and mighty God, high and lifted up. He is that, but He's also... Um, your Abba who numbers the hair on your heads and for some of you that's easier than for others and he holds you in his arms um, and um, he wipes every tear from your eyes that's, the, that's what he, he loves you and that evokes in you love for him and, and that evokes you also a desire to please him I, I want to do what God says not because I'm afraid I'm going to go to hell I already know that's not going to happen so, I, but I love him, so I want to make him happy. I want to please him. Discipline without tenderness and affection produces long-term anger and discouragement. The way we love children shapes the way they understand God's love. Did you know that? They identify when you're little kids. They're like two, three years old. They identify you with God. They have very little difficulty. It's difficult to make that distinction in their heads. So, um, 
You know, if you're always cold and hard and self-centered and you're so focused with them, what are they going to think about Father God when they grow up, right? That's why a lot of people have a hard time with the title Father for God because their own fathers were horrible in need. They didn't love them. So you're, you have to have affection for your to be, be tender, loving, kind, and only disciplined in that context, right? The fifth thing that can cause discouragement, and um, I'll just briefly talk about this one. I yelled at Emma the other day. Um, no, I just said don't yell. Um, I yelled at Emma the other day, and this was because I was working on my computer, and she came in. Uh, this is often when I have little clashes with my kids. And she comes in and says, Daddy, can you take me out to lunch? She went to go to lunch with Daddy. And I said, no. I'm working. All right, so she comes back in. A little later, Daddy, I'm going to go lunch with you. No! Can't you see him concentrating? So she committed the third time, and I let her have it. I said, How many times have I told you not to come here while I'm working? Go! Go! And then, you know, Ann comes to me a little later. And said, You know, that wasn't very, that wasn't very kind. Um, and I realized, and some of the people, I told this to some people at church, and they helped me as well, but. Um, I realized that the way I've been teaching my daughter about Jesus and how to live as a follower of Jesus and the way that I just behaved toward her were out of sync. And so the only way to rectify that was for me to say to her, Honey, I'm sorry. I was wrong. That was evil of your daddy to do. Let's go to lunch. So, apologies are sometimes necessary. I think what parents sometimes have a temptation to do because we want to preserve our status and respect in the eyes of our children is to self-justify when we make mistakes. Oh no, I think the reason I yell at you is because of this and this and this. No, you were just wrong. Admit that. That's wonderful. When they see that, they see a follower of Jesus recognizing that he or she is a sinner. It's great. Okay, fifth thing, then we'll move on. I'm linking affection to achievement. Um, God's love for you is if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, and even before you're a believer in Jesus Christ, God's love for you is never conditioned on proficiency or achievement. Like, so if you really mess up bad tomorrow, God's not going to say, oh, well, that's it. I don't want you anymore. I didn't see that one coming. He's not going to do that. If your kid gets the idea that your affection changes depending on his or her performance at school or at work or at sports or whatever, he or she will internalize that and begin to love themselves based on performance. Right? They're going to have this inner voice throughout their whole life saying, you got to do, you got to achieve, you got to be successful, you got to do this, and nobody's going to love you. You will have created that. And that's over the long, long term going to produce anger and discouragement. Most often this happens when men, especially, have like these dreams about who they wanted to be when they were in high school or um, playing football or whatever, or they had this dream about who they wanted to be, but they didn't quite make it. So instead of you know just dealing with that, they pour that into their kids. Right? So I wasn't quarterback, but he can be quarterback. I'm gonna make him make sure he goes to practice and does well. Right? Linking affection to achievement will produce anger. Okay, so those are just five examples of things that I've seen and things I've experienced and ways that you can discourage or anger your children. Um, all right, now turn, keep it, if you're there already, open to Ephesians 6, verse 4, if you're not going to turn there. Um, notice what God says in opposition to provoking anger. Don't provoke your children to anger, but, that means... Instead of, like, you know, the thing to do instead of provoking them to anger, in other words, this ultimately will not provoke them to anger, even though it might, in the short term, bring them up in the knowledge and discipline of the Lord. Right, so again, this might provoke short term anger. Daddy, I don't want to go to church. I don't want to go to church. Da, 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 da. That might provoke short term anger, and that's okay, because Scripture tells us that in the long term, it's going to produce joy, happiness, goodness. It's a wonderful thing. The text envisions parents, fathers in particular, as pastors in their families, and family life centered on knowing Jesus and His Word. 
Jesus is not someone you take your kids to visit on Sunday or not. I think Paul has Deuteronomy 11 in mind in this text in Ephesians. So why don't we go ahead and turn there if you have your books marked. Ephesians, uh, excuse, Deuteronomy chapter 11, beginning in verse 18. You shall therefore lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul, and you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontless between your eyes. Who's he talking to in this part of the text? Parents, right? So the, the, uh, know the Bible, know the, know the Word of God, right? Okay, now, um, you shall teach them then to your children, talking of them when you are sitting in your house, and when you are walking by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. Deuteronomy 11 envisions a family life in which kids see Jesus everywhere and in everything. Are you angry? Let's talk to Jesus about that. Are your feelings hurt? Let's pray. Are you worried? Let's see what the Bible says about worry. Are you afraid of what's in your closet? Well, let's go in the closet and pray and ask Jesus to chase whatever is out of the closet out of the closet. Do you have a test? Let's ask God to help you remember what you study. Do you have a decision made? Let's open the Bible. God has blessed you with food and shelter and friends and parents. Let's praise Him and thank Him for that every day and on Sunday especially. Jesus, in other words, shouldn't be a curse word in your house like when you bang your finger on a nail or a hammer and just, you say, that's not really this year, Jesus, right? Um, it, the Bible shouldn't be dusty in your home. Christian home needs to be one in which the family regularly studies the Bible, and that's your responsibility, fathers, and prays together and where scripture, prayer, and God is enmeshed into life so that from toddlerhood, from toddlerhood, kids know where daddy and mommy go to find love and go to find truth. They know where to go for true answers, where joy is laid out and where hope is held out. Obviously, and I have to say this, unfortunately, obviously this means church is non-negotiable. Obviously. Obviously. There's no training youth group for church. Both and. When you set something else in the place of church, you communicate that God's commands to you, Hebrews 10, 25, if you want to look it up, are secondary to your children's whims and desires, or worse, your whims and desires. Honey, I'm just kind of tired. This is bad. You communicate that sleep, or sports, or friends, or some other idol, and that's what it becomes when you let it take precedence over a direct command from God, Hebrews 10, 25, if you let them see that that can trump God's expressed will. Now, the reason kids argue about church isn't, isn't, well, maybe because they're bored. I personally don't care if my kids are bored. I think it's good for them to be bored. Because really boring, let's just talk about that for just one second. There's no real such thing as boring. It's just that you are not smart enough to figure out a way to make something interesting. Right? So if you put your kids in boring situations over and over again, they got to learn to entertain themselves, possibly by listening. Right? So we don't let them say bored in our house, but that's just beside the point. The main reason kids argue about going to church is because parents at some point along the line have made church an option. I mean, they argue about going to school, but not as much because they know they're just going to have to go. Right? But at some point, you said to them, you allowed a complaint or a bad attitude or, or whatever to determine you saying to them, maybe you know what the fuck about. All right, whatever.
So kids forced to go to school, but not church, learn, hey, school is really important, church isn't. Or allowed to go to sports stuff and not church, um, in place of church, they learn, hey, sports is really important, but God isn't. They learn that very easily. All right, so your home is to be a place where Jesus is integrated into every aspect of life, every day, so that your kids see him in everything. One more thing and we're done. One more thing, I promise. As you're doing this, there will be a temptation to preach what we've called before moral deism rather than the gospel. You'll want to point your kids to the Bible to teach them how to be good people and do good things. And so when they fail, you say, oh no, look, the parent says this. You need to do this. Do it. Do it. Go. God used the law in my life this way. And I hope if he's never used it this way in your life, I hope he does today. He used it this way in my life. He said, uh, okay, Matt, I want you to um, love me with all your heart, soul, and mind. I can't do that for a second. I fail at that miserably. Okay, love your neighbor. I can't do that. I'm horrible at that. Right, so God used failure to follow the law in my life as an opportunity to show me that if it's just up to me, I have no hope, but that he loves me enough to send his son to do for me what I couldn't do for myself. So I was able then to stop hoping in me, stop looking for me to me for the answers to life and to look to Jesus. Right? Okay, now, um, that's the way you as Christian parents can use failure too in your children's lives. Avoid the temptation to tell your kids to trust in themselves or their own abilities. Don't build their self-esteem. When they mess up, say, yeah, man, obedience is tough stuff, isn't it? I wonder why you keep messing up. I wonder what that is. Keep doing that over and over and over again. You know, the Bible talks about that. There's a reason you keep messing up. Because you're a sinner, just like your daddy. And you need Jesus, just like your daddy does. Teach them to despair of themselves and set their trust and their hope in God. All right. We're going to stop here. And for those of you, again, who are um, not parents, um, of biological children, you are parents of uh, spiritual children. I said last week, if you're a member of the body of Christ, all the little kids running around here are yours. So um, care for them and help support the parents who have to raise them to obey and honor God. Um, help them do that. I hope you have heard something here um, that we need to take on in our truth. Well, let's go ahead and pray. We're with you. Father, thank you for um, this day. Thank you for bringing us here. And I pray, Lord, that, um, well, first, I guess I confess as a father, as a parent, that I am a a failure at that. I don't do as I should. Um, I confess that not only my, for myself, but also for all the fathers here. Lord, I pray not just for your forgiveness, but for your strength and power to conform our lives and the lives of our families to your word. Help us to preach the gospel at all times, both in word and in deed, especially to our children. We pray this in Jesus' name.